<laughs> so if you think you're having a bad day today, I would like to introduce you to Stefan Thomas, who is having a lot of bad days. And this is because he has a crypto wallet that has 7,002 Bitcoin on it, which would be an amazing thing. Something that last week would have had a valuation of around $280 million. But he, like many people, forgot the password to that wallet. Heartbreakingly or hilariously, depending on who you are as a person, of the 18.5 million Bitcoin that is out there, 20% is either lost or in stranded wallets. I mean, you're talking about, what is that? $140 billion of value. And for Stefan, he has this life-changing amount of money that he cannot access. If, if he enters the password wrong 10 times, it's all gone forever. And he's entered it incorrectly eight times. Just imagine that there's a door in your house with a little window and you can see inside and it will change your life forever. But you can't, you can't get, it's just out of reach. How must that weigh on you day in, day out? That is, oh, how would it just not slowly drive you mad? But uh, on that happy note, welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. It is Tuesday, January 12th, 2021. And let's just jump into the news of the day so you can get back to yours. First up, we'll start with entertainment slash celebrity news and specifically, the streaming wars, which just keeps giving and giving, which is why I love competition. You know, some of the last big streaming news that we covered were all these big releases coming to Disney. Plus, the massive announcement that huge movies would be going to theaters as well as HBO Max the same day in 2021. And now, Netflix has officially confirmed today that they will be releasing a new movie every week this year. This is including a combination of original productions and acquisitions from all genres. And in this is a reel they release, there is no shortage of names and talent. They have Gal Gadot, Ryan Reynolds, Dwayne Johnson, Chris Hemsworth, Jennifer Lawrence, Leonardo DiCaprio, and more. And Netflix's announcement also comes at a time when spending on streaming services is expected to see a massive boost. According to projections from the Consumer Technology Association, spending on streaming and software could hit a record $112 billion this year. That's an 11% growth from 2020, which was already a 31% growth from 2019, with the CTA saying that spending on streaming subscriptions specifically could reach $41 billion. And part of that conversation this year involves Quibi. Remember her, good old Quibi, spent over a billion dollars and just bombed in amazing fashion last year. But of course, after that massive failure, there was a question of what happens to all the content, including things that haven't even been released yet. And what we're now seeing are reports that this company that spent over a billion dollars on this content is reportedly selling it for under $100 million to Roku, which I think is actually a massive and smart move. If you're more of an Apple TV user, you might be shocked to learn that Roku is actually in 50 million households. And now for a fraction of the price, they get to bulk up their original offerings, which is huge for them. And their position as kind of the everyman streaming device in the midst of a pandemic is probably part of the reason that their stock has tripled over the last six months. Also, in more homegrown entertainment news, we saw a Spanish streamer by the name of David Greff Martinez absolutely destroying Twitch's all-time concurrent viewer record, bringing in over 2.4 million people who tuned in to watch him reveal his Icon series Fortnite skin, which was already a big deal in itself because Fortnite's Icon series are reserved for the game's top creators, including the likes of Ninja and Loser Fruit. Well, his outfit was the eighth one in the series. I mean, he's number one as far as viewership of a release and by a landslide. In fact, according to Twitch Tracker, one of the only things that is close to him is the 1.1 million viewer record that was set by the Esports League E-League TV in 2018. Then we got social media lawsuit news. Of course, yesterday we mentioned that Parler is suing Amazon for booting them from their cloud services, claiming that they're acting anti-competitively. But there was also another lawsuit yesterday that ended up getting overlooked. Yesterday, you also had Rumble filing a lawsuit against Google, accusing the company of using its search engine and mobile services to unfairly boost YouTube over rivals. Rumble, which is a video sharing service which has become increasingly popular with conservatives who believe that they're being censored on more mainstream platforms claimed that Google willfully and unlawfully created and maintained a monopoly in the online video sharing platform market in at least two ways. First, by unfairly rigging its search algorithms so that YouTube's videos come up first in search results, and second, by requiring all Android smartphone manufacturers to pre-install YouTube on their phones in order to acquire the right to use the Android operating system. With Rumble saying that these two actions have allowed Google to wrongfully divert massive traffic to YouTube, depriving Rumble of the additional traffic, users, uploads, brand awareness, and revenue it would have otherwise received, with a company seeking at least 
$2 billion in damages. Now, in response to this, a Google spokesperson called the lawsuit baseless, but many have also pointed out that the allegations here echo those made in dozens of antitrust lawsuits recently filed and brought against Google by the Justice Department in almost every state, where, among other things, the lawsuits claim that Google illegally prevented competition in large part by using billions it collects from advertisers to pay for phone manufacturers and carriers to keep Google as their default engine and pre-install apps like YouTube. Which is also why I'll say that, at least from a strategy standpoint, it feels like this lawsuit from Rumble is smart. Because the thinking could be here, if the cases don't go Google's way with the Justice Department and these states, which of course Rumble doesn't have to put any money into, it likely strengthens their separate case. Also in the tech and business world, we're seeing downloads for Signal and Telegram surging in the last week after WhatsApp announced that it'll start forcing all users outside the EU and the United Kingdom to share personal data with Facebook. With WhatsApp, which is owned by Facebook last week, telling users they must allow Facebook and its subsidiaries to collect their phone numbers, contacts, phone numbers, and locations, among other things. And if you don't agree to those new terms by February 8th, you lose access to the messaging app. This is a move that outraged many, prompting many to call for people to delete WhatsApp, start using other encrypted messaging services like Signal, like Telegram. This also including massive names like Elon Musk, who tweeted, use Signal. Funny enough, and this is a side thing uh, that I think touches on the reactionary nature of the internet. Seemingly just that tweet from Musk caused stocks for a totally unrelated company, Signal Advance, to soar by 11,700%. But pertaining to the main story as well, it appears those calls for people to use other encrypted messaging apps has been heard. According to data from App analytics firm Sensor Tower, Signal saw 7.5 million installs globally through the App Store and Google Play from January 6th to January 10th alone. That is a 4,200% increase from the previous week, and Telegram saw even more downloads. During that same time, gaining 9 million users, up 91% from the previous week. In fact, it was the most downloaded app in the United States. Now, WhatsApp, for their part, tried to do damage control, issuing a statement yesterday saying that its update doesn't affect the privacy of messages sent between friends and family, and adding that it only includes changes related to messaging a business on WhatsApp, which is optional and provides further transparency about how we collect and use data. But also of note here, some of the things that we're seeing with these spikes is actually from a combination of things. Or like some of the spikes that we're seeing for Telegram are due to the fact that Parler has been shut down and Trump's been banned and suspended from various platforms. And according to reports, far right Telegram chat room memberships have increased significantly in recent days. But from that, let's pay some bills really quick and thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, a website, an online store, a whatever, make it with Squarespace. Squarespace empowers people of all kinds to create their online web presence or launch their passion projects, and it's a place that so many people trust and where everyone can find and make a home. It's also easy to see why. There is nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever, and creating a beautiful website with Squarespace's all-in-one platform has never been so simple. It is extremely intuitive and easy to use, and you gain access to things that are incredibly important, like their award-winning marketing tools and analytics, and you can get personalized support from their award-winning customer care team via email, or live chat. Whatever you need, they are available 24-7 to help out. So if you want to check it out, see why so many people love it, go ahead and start your free trial today over at squarespace.com slash Phil. And when, not if, you realize you love it, make sure you enter in code Phil to get 10% off your first purchase. Then in how did this happen news, uh, we saw a Chinese home goods company called Per Cotton finding themselves in a PR nightmare. And that because the company released an ad for their makeup remover wipes for on the go. And um, just trying to take a second to think, how would I showcase that? Well, uh, someone, and I imagine groups of people that had to approve this decided a great idea is to show a woman she's walking home maybe by herself. All of a sudden we see a man behind her. He's stalking her. He's getting closer. So she grabs into her bag to defend herself by removing her makeup so she becomes less appealing. And at this point, it's almost amazing that they didn't also add the tagline per cotton. Stop asking for it. Now initially in response to this, we saw the company saying that the ad was meant to be creative, uh, but as the situation grew and grew, they ended up issuing an apology, kind of. I say kind of because they issued what has been called an official apologizing love letter that is really just a small apology and then a page and a half boasting about the company and their products. But this has been a massive social story. In fact, the hashtag cotton apology on Weibo has received over 500 million views. Then in last minute decision news, we saw Secretary of State Mike Pompeo redesignating Cuba as a state sponsor of terrorism. This move, of course, coming in the last days of the Trump administration and we'll see Cuba joining the ranks of Iran, 
Syria, and North Korea on the state sponsor of terrorism list. And this move is largely believed to be symbolic and a show of support for Cuban Americans who largely did not support the restoration of relations with Cuba under Obama. And with this, we're seeing some experts saying they're unsure if Cuba deserves the designation, saying that while Cuba is undoubtedly a dictatorship and denies human rights, it doesn't export terrorism. But on the other side of this, we saw the State Department justifying the move by pointing to Cuba's actions in Venezuela to help prop up Nicolas Maduro, housing 10 Colombian rebel leaders, and hosting American fugitives wanted for justice since the 70s. And as far as what real world things it does, the move triggers automatic sanctions, although they will likely have little effect considering the limited trade between the United States and Cuba. In the short term, this could also affect how businesses and banks across the world work, with Cuba fearing repercussions from the State Department, but also in the long term, it is likely going to be just a small speed bump in Biden's plans to improve relations with Cuba. Though, I think it could be argued that maybe that's even part of the reason they did this. Well, Donald Trump and Republicans, yes, did lose the White House in this last election in Florida specifically, which is an incredibly important swing state. They overperformed with Cuban Americans with their anti-Cuban messaging, trying to tie socialism to Democrats being very effective. So perhaps they see it as a good move to force the Biden administration to make a choice, stick with what the Trump administration wants or do something that could hurt them in the next election. Then it's definitely important to know that following last Wednesday's attack on the Capitol, an attack that left multiple people dead, several Capitol officers have been suspended and a number of others are under investigation. And according to Representative Tim Ryan, this includes situations like an officer who was seen donning a MAGA hat who allegedly started directing people around as well as another officer who allegedly took a selfie with insurrectionists outside of the Capitol, though at this time it is unclear if it is a different officer than the one that appears in this video, right? That one appearing to be inside the Capitol. Also, in addition to that, Ryan said about 10 to 15 other Capitol officers are under investigation. And this also for suspected involvement with or inappropriate support for the insurrection attempt. And in one of eight separate reported investigations, some officers were found to have allegedly posted messages showing support for the rally that preceded the attack. But the Secret Service also indicating that one officer posted a message to Facebook in which he accused lawmakers who were formally accepting the Electoral College vote of committing treason on live TV. Also, and another investigators uncovered inappropriate images of President-elect Joe Biden on a Capitol officer's social media, though the exact nature of those photos is still unclear. Inappropriate could describe a number of completely different things. Also, important news around this situation. This morning, we had Senator Bill Cassidy releasing images of a man who Capitol Police are looking for. And this, because he's believed to be connected to the death of Officer Brian Sicknick, who died last week from injuries that he sustained during the attack. In one photo, you can see the man's face clearly. In the other, he's wielding a red object. Cassidy also providing the FBI hotline number for anyone who recognizes this man. And so just to add my spotlight and, and bullhorn to this, if you recognize this man, please contact the authorities. Also, regarding other charges across the board in connection to what happened last Wednesday today, we heard from acting U.S. Attorney Michael Sherwin. We're looking at significant felony cases tied to sedition and conspiracy. Just yesterday, our office organized a strike force of very senior national security prosecutors and public corruption prosecutors. Their only marching orders from me are to build seditious and conspiracy charges related to the most heinous acts that occurred in the Capitol. And these are significant charges that have felonies with uh, prison terms of tw up to 20 years. In addition to that, we're looking and taking a priority with cases in which weapons were involved and cases in which destructive devices were involved. As people know through news reports, there were pipe bombs found outside the Capitol. The ATF is working on that. Metro Police is working on that. FBI is working on that to find that individual or individuals who planted those devices. But also of note there, he is just talking about the priority, not everyone, which is why he also said. Regardless of if it was just a trespass in the Capitol or if someone planted a pipe bomb, you will be charged and you will be found. And to just throw in my personal opinion here, I cannot wait to watch all of these people get charged. Especially if any others are like what we've seen so far with Adam Johnson. If you don't remember, he's the schmuck that decided it was a great idea not only to steal Pelosi's lectern, but uh, be very excited for photographs of it. Yesterday, we got this amazing moment of his lawyer speaking with the press. Part of what you have to you know, factor into is again, you just have to drill down on what actually happened. You have a photograph of our client you know, in, in a building, um, you know, unauthorized to be there with, uh, you know, what appears to be a podium or a lectern. I'm not exactly sure which one it is called, um, but, but that's what we have. Obviously that presents problems for you as a defense attorney in that you have your client in the building at the time of the uh, break-in. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah I, I don't know the, you know, how to else explain that, but yeah, that's, that's, that would be a problem. I'm not a magician and neither is Mr. Digney. So yeah, we've got a photograph of our client who would appear to be inside the federal building or inside the Capitol with, with uh, government property. <laughs> is that a real lawyer? Or is that just a guy he knows? Anyway. You know, in addition,
addition to the many stories we have of what happened last Wednesday, there is also the incredibly important story of what happens next. And actually, regarding that issue, on Monday, we saw Trump declaring a state of emergency in Washington, D.C., citing emergency conditions. And this is big because Trump's order allows the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Emergency Management Agency to assist the city in any emergency response until January 24th, if it does occur. Prior to this, we also saw D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser declaring a state of emergency last Wednesday during the attacks on the Capitol, but she also doesn't have the same ability to mobilize federal forces as Trump. Meanwhile, further rumors of violent demonstrations ahead of Biden's inauguration on January 20th have continued to swirl online. So because of all that chatter on Sunday, Bowser wrote to Acting Secretary of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, urging the administration to issue a pre-disaster declaration. However, also connected to this, last night Wolf resigned, becoming the third official in Trump's cabinet to do so, following Education Secretary Betsy DeVos and Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao. And in addition to the threats in DC, according to an FBI bulletin obtained by multiple news outlets, armed protests are being planned at all 50 state capitals ahead of Inauguration Day. And that reportedly includes people who say they plan to storm state, local, and federal government courthouses if Trump is removed from office early. With the FBI noting, they have warned that if Congress attempts to remove POTUS via the 25th Amendment, a huge uprising will occur. However, that warning also includes those who say they're planning on storming government offices anyway on Inauguration Day, regardless of whether or not Trump is removed early. And with all that, we've seen federal law enforcement advising state and local agencies to bump up their security at government buildings. Also, according to a memo from the FBI's Minneapolis field office, which was issued on December 29th, the far-right Boogaloo movement plans to hold rallies in cities across the country on January 17th, which, if you're unfamiliar, it's an anti-government pro-gun movement, which is also advocated for, you know, little things like the second civil war or the collapse of society. But you know, all of that comes as we're now seeing reports that an internal memo by an FBI office in Virginia warned of violence and war at the Capitol on January 6th. Even though this past Friday, the head of DC's field office claimed that there was no indication of any planned attacks that day. But if you just read this memo, that account does not match up in the slightest. In fact, it says, be ready to fight. Congress needs to hear glass breaking, doors being kicked in, and blood from their BLM and Antifa slave soldiers being spilled. Get violent, we get our president or we die. Nothing else will achieve this goal. But today you had the FBI arguing that it had acted ahead of the attack by arresting the leader of the Proud Boys shortly after he arrived in DC for the event. This partly because of suspicion of violence. Of course, though that alone didn't stop the attacks the next day. But yeah, I guess the main point is just, be careful out there. We like to tell ourselves that the number of extremists, it's just, it's so small. But then you get a Charlottesville, you get people storming the Capitol. And it feels like more than ever, especially for the people that it would reflect negatively on it because they enabled it to happen, even if they don't support the extremist views, it kind of just evaporates and they change the story and they deflect and they're like, what are you talking about? So I obviously want you to be careful in this upcoming week, the upcoming weeks. Just, just remember, don't forget, it's there. And wait, don't let someone else's feelings try to override your facts. Also, other news connected to this story, at least three members of Congress have now tested positive for COVID-19 after locking down in closed quarters last Wednesday. And after all that, lawmakers were warned on Sunday of potential exposure by Congress's attending physician, Brian Monahan. And then on Monday, Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman, a Democrat from New Jersey, announced that she had tested positive and believes that she was exposed while isolating in the Capitol, noting that multiple House members did not wear masks. And footage actually even shows Republican lawmakers refused using masks from a Democratic member during the lockdown. And Coleman, who I imagine would be in the high risk category because she is a 75 year old cancer survivor, is experiencing cold-like symptoms, but she's also not the only lawmaker in this position. With Democratic Representative Pramila Jayapal from Washington announcing she too had tested positive late on Monday, also blaming the lack of mask wearing in the Capitol. Writing in a Twitter thread, only hours after Trump incited a deadly assault on our Capitol, many Republicans still refuse to take the bare minimum COVID-19 precaution and simply wear a damn mask in a crowd crowded room during a pandemic, creating a super spreader event on top of a domestic terrorist attack. Any member who refuses to wear a mask should be fully held accountable for endangering our lives because of their selfish idiocy. And now today, uh, we add him to the list. Brad Schneider, a Democrat from Illinois, has echoed the same frustrations and announced that he has also tested positive. Also, while we're on the note of COVID, there, there are two big things I want to mention. The first being that vaccination sites will be opening throughout California as the state loosens restrictions on who will be eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine, which is a very big deal because right now, California is actually falling behind behind other states in terms of vaccination rates. With so far only 783,476 of the 2.9 million doses the state has received having been administered. So the state is hoping that these new sites will speed up the process. And among the places turning into vaccination sites, you have places like Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, which was actually previously used as a testing site. In Orange County, Disneyland's going to become a vaccination site at some point this week. And then finally with COVID, it's important to know that the Trump administration is actually expanding its vaccine rollout strategy in an effort to vaccinate more Americans. And there are three big changes. The first 
first change is that they're recommending that states open availability to everyone older than 65 and to any adult with a pre-existing condition that makes them high risk. Second is widening the locations where people can get vaccinated, including community health centers, more pharmacies, and even mass vaccination sites if states wanna go in that direction. And the third step, and one of the biggest ones, is making every dose available to the states right now, including second doses, which the federal government had been holding back. With this news, notably coming as virus cases are still surging, the slow distribution and administration of the vaccine has been criticized widely. And that is where I'm going to end today's show. A, a quick last note, if you've ever purchased something for me, check your email or maybe your spam folder today. Also, if you signed up for the text line, check that. I, I sent you something secret that I'd love for you to be a part of. Also, if you can't wait a whole day to see my dumb face again, you, you can click or tap right there. Maybe you missed yesterday's show or you wanna watch something different. But uh, with that said, thanks for watching. News that matters for people that care. I'll see you tomorrow.